Okay, uh, let's start out and just state your, your name and spell your name. Yeah, my name is Tom McLaughlin. My name is spelled M-C, capital L-A-U-G-H-L-I-N. Okay, um, where did you grow up? I grew up in Boston, Massachusetts. And tell me, when, when, I, when I say, you, you can expand on it. You know, you, you were brought up at the North End or you were... No, I was, lived in a community called South Boston, referred to as Southie. There was a peninsula sticking into Boston Harbor. Boston Harbor has four or five penins peninsulas, one of which is called Southie. So it has a, a lot of uh, nautical influence there. There are docks for ships and also several yacht clubs. So you grow up with boats all around you. And who were your parents? My parents were, uh, my father was a police officer. He was a police detective and my mother was a housewife. She was formerly a secretary and worked for the A&P headquarters in Boston at one time. Brothers and sisters? I had four sisters. I grew up with four sisters in one bathroom. How, how, where, where did you fit in? I was the oldest, fortunately. Okay. Um, how did you get to Wilmington? Or, or, let's, let's go. Explain to me, okay, you were in Boston, then you left Boston, or you went to school, and then you ended up at the Pond. Uh, I went to that? MIT and graduated in 1951, and uh, got a job with the DuPont Company. And that's how you got to? I came to Wilmington, and being single, they stopped shipping me all over the country. They sent me to Louisville, then to uh, Charleston, West Virginia, then to down to Louisiana, and finally I spent a lot of time in Orange, Texas, on the Gulf Coast. Okay. Um, where were you uh, December 7th, 1941? And then what are your, your, your recollections? I was recollection. I was out on a family outing. We used to take Sunday drives in my uncle's 1938 Pontiac. And we were stopped at a Howard Johnson's near the Sagamore Bridge in Cape Cod, Massachusetts. And we were all, I was enjoying a triple malted milk with my sisters and some friends. And all of a sudden he said, the Japs have bombed Pearl Harbor. And I remember one of my sister's friends says, Pearl Harbor, is that a jewelry store? And then, then I, that, was, that was the only thing I remember about, is it a jewelry store? So it that shows how some, very few people knew about Pearl Harbor, unless you knew people in the Navy and heard the term used a lot, because if you had friends in the Navy, they talked about uh, Pearl Harbor, they talk about uh, the naval base down in Rhode Island, Newport, and things like that, and Great Lakes. So, so I was familiar, I knew what Pearl Harbor meant, so I realized then that we were going to be in war. Now, how old were you then? I was uh, 16. So you were still in you were still in school. I was still in school. Yeah, yeah, high school. Yeah. Okay. So tell me, say this again in like December seventh, nineteen. Say the whole sentence. December seventh, nineteen forty-one. I was where? I was in a Howard no, no, Johnson. Say, say the. Say, say, repeat. December seventh, nineteen forty-one. December seventh, nineteen forty-one. I was out on a family outing. We used to take family drives in my uncle's nineteen thirties. 38 Pontiac, and I was with my sister and some of her friends and the nan and uncle when we were, I was enjoying a triple malted milk when someone come in and says, the Japs have bombed Pearl Harbor. And I remember one of my sister's friends says, Pearl Harbor, is that a jewelry store? Well, it was funny, I was telling you about Bill McLaughlin. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Bill McLaughlin was sitting in the stands at the, watching the Wilmington Clippers play. Yeah. And that was his thing. Who's Pearl Harbor and why are they doing those things to her? Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm. So, uh, okay, so let's continue from Pearl Harbor. Where did you go from Pearl Harbor? Now, Pearl Harbor happened, you were still a junior was, in high school? or I was a junior in high school, yes. So, uh, a lot of our friends, you know, being a, a nautical area, Boston, with a lot of peninsulas, everyone all my older friends were rushing to join up in the Marine Corps. 
So uh, at that time, I, I had a discussion with my father, who was a World War I veteran. He said, make sure you finish your education, get your high school diploma, and then uh, you'll be better prepared for whatever's going to happen. So uh, eventually, I was at that time, I was a very avid model airplane builder. And I said, well, gee, I should become a pilot. So I'll wait till I graduate and see if I can get in the Air Force. So, uh, being a, I would join several model airplane clubs, and I was building planes and models and flying them in contests. And then a friend of mine, I had a friend, and we both were contacted by a guy who says, you make model airplanes? And I said, yeah, he says, I got a job for you in the summer vacation. I said, where is it? At MIT. They have a wind tunnel over there, and they're doing aeronautical research. And if you, they're looking for guys to make model airplanes. So I got my first job at MIT in the aeronautical laboratory. And uh, I made, we were working on the design of the Grumman Hellcat. And they wanted to see how strong the wings were before they would flutter. And I was assigned to this group called the Flutter Research Group. And of course, in any job, they like to play pranks on you. So one day they sent me down to the wind tunnel saying one of the electrical connections is loose. We'll go in and find out. So when you went in the wind tunnel, you took your shoes off and you had your socks on, you were in, in pants, you know, jeans or something like that. So I went fooling around looking for the connect. All of a sudden I heard a click as the door was closed. And the next thing I knew, they were turning up the wind in the wind tunnel. So they had these, these uh, mounts there, to, which I grabbed a hold of like this, and they ran the wind up to 200 miles an hour with me in the wind tunnel. My socks came off. My pockets opened, and all my fortunately they had a big net down the end of the tunnel to catch things. And uh, they were all laughing. I could see them all outside the plexiglass window, all laughing, playing a joke on me. So they turned down the wind tunnel, and what I discovered is that I had dandruff before I went in the wind tunnel. When I got out of the wind tunnel, I had no more dandruff. It came out of my hair. So I realized <laughs> that was very funny. But it was, that was my first job I had was a war you know, doing research for, for aeronautical engineering. Then the next thing you know, I went over and volunteered for the Army, and uh, there, was a, there were programs going on where you could get a year or two of college in the Army, so I signed up for an outfit called ASTP, Army Specialized Training Program. And the song in the Army ASTP was, Oh, take down your service flag, mother, your son's in the ASTP. So they sent me to uh, Camp Hood, Texas, where I learned to become an anti-tank hunter. Then I went to Texas A&M University for a while. Then all of a sudden, one day, they came in and they said, the program is terminated. You're all going to be reassigned. But this was just before the D-Day invasion and what happened, they were trying to get you know, fellows for the day in D-Day invasion. And uh, so they sent me to Fort Sam Houston, Texas, and that's where they gave me a very strong in-depth interview. And they say, well, what language do you speak? And I said, well, I can speak German fairly fluently because I operated a ham radio station. I, I listened to German programs during the war. I was listening to their reports from the Russian front on shortwave, and I could speak German with a fairly good accent, and I knew the German terminology for, tech, for military items. So they assigned me to uh, military intelligence, and I was assigned to uh, an MP outfit, which was going to become a combat, combat M MPs. And uh, our job was, of the D-Day invasion, was to uh, get the prisoners off the beach and back to England as soon as possible. So we went in on, late on D-Day, we went in on trucks, and we followed the supply trucks in, carrying the munitions and food. And we thought we were guarding the, f the munitions and the food. But no, because when those trucks were emptied, we would have Germans on them going back to the beach. So I was, I think that after D-Day, I, I didn't get a good night's sleep for about four days. I was completely exhausted. And uh, of course, there was artillery shelling, and the other problem was you walk around and look out for landmines. 
because I learned when I want to walk down the road, I wouldn't walk on the road. I'd look for trees and I'd walk along the trees where the roots were coming out far. And I know the Germans couldn't bury a landmine with the roots coming out there. So I'd jump from tree to tree. Be very, very careful because some of the people I know had stepped on landmines and lost their legs. It was a very messy business, so. So we would start collecting the, the prisoners and I'd, I'd have to interview them, line them up and find a, First thing you did with the German prisoners, you separated the officers. You could tell them by their insignia. All the officers had silver, gold braid insignia on their shoulders, and the non-coms had white piping around their shoulder epaulette with little pips on it. And you're looking for the guy with white piping and two pips. He was what the Germans call Oberfeldwebel, or oh, that's the top sergeant. Like this guy, the Marine sergeant you see on the History Channel. He, they were used to tough guys, you know. So who was the, who was the Oberfeldwebel? So once you establish who was the Oberfeldwebel, you tell him what you want done, and he'd give the orders. So uh, we'd get them back to the beach, and finally we had some LCs coming in, and they'd unload, and then they, the engineers had bulldozers, and they would bulldoze sand into the tank deck of the LST for ballast, and as we got on. I noticed they had a lot of garbage cans stacked around. And I was wondering what it was for, and they also had big boxes of toilet paper. And uh, then we'd march the German prisoners on, pull up and take off, and head back for England. And now I know why they had all the garbage cans there, because all the German prisoners were always up getting sick, seasick. And those were the puking pans and the crapping pans. So, and we get to Portsmouth, England, put them on trains. And after seven trips across the, the channel like this, they, my company was uh, reassigned to take the Germans up to Glasgow, Scotland. And uh, the USS West Point, which was a big two-stack uh, travel ship built just before the war, and uh, was, they renamed the West Point. It was originally the United States. It was the biggest transport ship we had. It was on its par with the Queen Elizabeth and the Queen Mary. So they said, well, the company, the escort company that's supposed to be on this boat didn't get here in time, so your company's going to take them back to the States. So we got all these German prisoners on this boat and took off from Gorak outside of Glasgow, Scotland, and headed back alone out in the ocean. The reason we were not in the convoy was we were faster than any, we were doing about 20, 28 knots or something like that, and no German submarine could catch us up with us. So. We got up on first day out at sea. We took German prisoners up on deck for, for what you might call it, uh, fresh air and exercise. And the first we took a whole pile of officers up, and one German officer comes up and he says, "Kein Geleitzug, kein Geleitzug, no convoy, no." And I say, "We have broke kein Geleitzug. We have wissen zu so schnell." And he says, "But there are U-boats out there." The Geneva Convention says, no, I says, no Geneva Convention, we are too fast for the U-boats. If you have any left, oh, we have a few U-boats. <laughs> and I explained to him, you know, that most of the German submarines have been sunk uh, in Murglisch, in Murglisch. We have been in Krieg. So <laughs> we, that was a great blow to him, the fact that we were out there with no, no, no escort. This means that everything we was being told on the German radio was false. Then they began to realize, you know, no Galeitzuk. They were all talking about it themselves. So the, the funny thing is that this ship arrived in Boston, my hometown, and we're standing up on deck, and I'm with my captain, he says, he says, you're from Boston, aren't you? He says, yeah. And I look over, and I could see my house in the distance on a peninsula. I said, that's my house over there. And he says, well, he says, you're going to get a show leave when we get here. So we pulled in and we got all the Germans off into a big marshalling yard down by the pier there and uh, where the trains came in. So we got them all on the train and then we went back to the ship and the captain says, all you fellows have a three-day pass. And most of the fellows in my outfit were from New York. So they were all running down and grabbing cabs and hitching rides to go into the South Station to get to St. New York. I went down and hitchhiked to ride to go a mile down the road to my house. <laughs> so I had a bag with dirty laundry in it, and I walked into the house and knocked on the door. 
my mother opens the door, almost fainted. <laughs> and uh, <coughs> I said, can you do my dirty laundry? And uh, that was a real surprise. And uh, so I had three-day pass in Boston. I was the hero, you know, back from the war, what happened to you and everything. So then I had to go back three days later and went back on the ship. And we went back to England, this time with American troops on board. And I discovered I knew four or five people from Boston who were on that ship. You just walk down the deck and see somebody you knew. It's amazing. They say if you walk through O'Hare Airport, you'll meet somebody you know. Yeah. Well, same thing was on these troop ships. You'd walk around, you'd see somebody you know. Because well, what, what you now, this is right after D-Day. Yeah. So you got back to England. You went, go, did you go back to England? Back to England, then we went back to, back to uh, France again. And by this time, they had cut off the entire Brest Peninsula. And you could hear the guns, and the, they were still shelling Brest. So we were backing up in the 94th Infantry Division, and they had come up to Saint Nazaire and Lorient. And they were expecting to take these sports, because this is where the Germans had their submarine pens, which were all underneath 12 feet of reinforced concrete. And the Air Force came in and bombed and bombed with B-25s, B-26s. Then they come over with B-24s and drop these thousand pounders and they just bounced off the concrete. So they had a problem there. The Germans were underground in the, in the submarine pens and you couldn't bomb them out. So what they did is because they needed Patton with driving towards Paris, so they needed somebody to hold the Germans, to prevent the Germans from coming out of Saint Nazaire and Lorient. So I was assigned to that division as an interpreter. So in the process of several months there, they had fights out in the field, you know, infantry patrols and things of that nature. And we were capturing Germans, and they were capturing Americans. So one day, we got a call from the International Red Cross. They say, we're trying to arrange a prisoner exchange with the Germans. And we want you to take about 150 German prisoners put them on two and a half ton trucks, and meet us down at a place called Etel, which near the near uh, San Nazaire. So we got all the Germans, all, we went back to the camp and told all the Germans, who wants to be exchanged? They all raised their hands. So we brought all these, uh, I'm thinking about the 165 Germans in four or five two and a half ton trucks and brought them down to Etel and lined them all up. Then all of a sudden, a boat comes across the river and there's a German officer in it, and then some more boats come over. And anyway, this ge first German officer come, come over is a medic. And he says, he lines all the Germans up and gives them orders in German. He says, open your mouth. Maul aufhören. Maul. The German word is, the German word in the army, Mund is the German word for mouth, but in the army, they use the word Maul because that's the, the mouth of an animal. And that was a joke in the German army, open your mouth. And uh, so anyway, this guy came down, he was the, and he was a doctor, and he inspects all the teeth among the prisoners, and he's, you can go back, back, back. We don't want you, you have bad teeth. They didn't have a dentist, and they didn't want anyone with bad teeth. So they were rejecting all these Germans because of their teeth. So anyway, the next thing you know, they started bringing American prisoners over. And of course, we didn't inspect them. We just took them back right away. And uh, one of the guys in my outfit recognized his next door neighbor was a prisoner being returned. It was so funny. And of course, we were very much concerned that something would go wrong during this ceasefire. And then, but the funny thing is, the German that first came over saluted the American colonel and shook hands with him. And they, they had the German photographers there taking movies, and the U.S. Signal Corps had taking movies, and I suppose these archives, somewhere in the archives out in St. Louis, these movies. But it was very, very funny. And uh, so then we went back, took, uh, took we released carry on people back in the trucks in which we take the Germans, plus the unexchanged Germans were all very, very sad. And, uh, then the our boys were telling us about how they were treated by the Germans, that they were treated very, very well. And of course, one of there was a, 
a, uh, one of the German officers was complaining about some of the tactics of the American Army were very brutal and inhuman because they had one of the American howitzers had put a shell into the local whorehouse or bordello and killed some of the best girls in San Nazaire. And this was Im immoral, unconscionable war. <laughs> <laughs> Now that was, then how soon after that, oh, they were there, you were there to the end of the war, correct? Yeah, but see, by the end of the war, uh, later on what happened, there was a big change. There was a, a ship coming and carrying the U.S. 66th Infantry Division, and uh, they were torpedoed by a German e-boat off Normandy, off the near Cherbourg, and they lost all of their communications equipment so they were not fit for combat so what they did is they took the 94th division which was holding the Germans in San Jose and Lorient and moved them up to, to uh, Strasbourg under Patton and the 66th division which didn't have a communications equipment came in and took their place so at that time my company was assigned to the 94th and we were moved up to Le Mans France to build a big prisoner of war camp which we did and then later on, as more prisoners came in, we kept moving forward and building prisoners of war camps and containing the prisoners. Until the end of the, until June or July of... Yeah. And then, then uh, we were in Germany when the war ended, handy, handling prisoners there. Okay. Um. I would be interpreting and interrogate, interrogating German prisoners. And... Uh, so tell me, so from, from that moment on, uh, how, how soon did the Nuremberg trials come up and all that stuff? They like, came up mean, after the war. You know, into that a little bit, like. The Nuremberg trials started, uh, I would say, uh, at the very end of 1945. So you, were, you stayed in Germany, you never went back, you never came back? I stayed in Germany, yeah. And being fluent in German, I was assigned to the Nuremberg trials. And uh, I was assigned to almost no counterintelligence corps, or the CIC, and I was assigned to a group known as the Personality Security Office. We were responsible for the security of all of the judges and prosecutors from both U.S., U.K., France, and Russia. And I was assigned to American Judge Judge Parker as his personal bodyguard. So I had to. I had to live in the set. They had a chateau outside of uh, Nuremberg, and Judge Parker and the U.S. Judge Biddle, Francis Drexel Biddle, was also there. He was the head U.S. Justice, and uh, he told me why he was sent to Nuremberg. Judge Biddle says, "See, Harry Truman was now president of the United States, and Biddle was the Attorney General of the United States." when they put Tom Prendergast in prison. And Tom Prendergast from Missouri was a friend of Harry Truman. So Harry Truman got even with Biddle by sticking him in Germany. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about the, uh, tell, us, tell us about the trials. Oh, the trials were very interesting because I used to go in, when I was, uh, when we were in, when we weren't guiding the judges, we had assignments to do. And sometimes the judges would go back to the security state at night under guard by the first infantry division. And we sometimes would have to come into the courthouse and help sift through documents, reading German, you know. And uh, one night I was in there and they had Hermann Goering in there. And I, I served Hermann Goering a cup of coffee. And he thanked me for it. And, uh, but it was, uh, sort of funny because uh, we developed a rapport with most of the German Nazi leaders, you know. They knew that they weren't going to get away with anything, and a lot of them were very cooperative. Some of them were very stupid, like Julius Stryker. He was a very ignorant, uncouth man. He couldn't even speak good German. And uh, the most intelligent, I think, was uh, this guy was head of their war industry. Albert Speer. He was very, very eloquent, speak fairly good English. He was very, very intelligent, very cooperative. 
and uh, even Herman Goering was would like to tell jokes occasionally, but we didn't get a chance to see these people unless there were special interrogations going on. But we came into the uh, my commanding officer. His name was Rolf Wartenberger, and he was Jewish and had escaped Germany as a young man. And he was, I was assigned to the CIC, this was part of the CIA counterintelligence corps. And I walked into the courtroom one day with him, and we were waiting to sit at, we had what they called gray passes, we could sit at the prosecutor's table if no one was there. So we walk in, we see anything, and he's talking with somebody, and Gehring takes a look at him. And he was one of the guys that captured Gehring. And Gehring just looks down like this, like this, and he nudges Hess. And I was standing right behind him, and I heard Gehring say to Hess, "Here is the Schweinhund, the Hartmere, the Finger. There's the son of a bitch that captured me." <laughs> and and Hess looks over, then Hess talks, ribbon top, ribbon top, looks over, and this guy is the center of attraction of all looking over at him. You know, "Here's the Schweinhund." Yeah. Very funny. Um, what? Let me ask you that. We'll, we'll go. We'll go. Uh, okay. Now after the war, let's go after the war. Okay. So you, you got. At, when did you f finish your active duty? Then where did you go? So tell me about from after the Nuremberg trials. When you got out, okay, and yeah. you went back to MIT. Yeah, I didn't. Whatever. I didn't stay till the end of the trials because my, I had what was, points. Everyone had points. And my points came up, and I got transferred to an outfit in uh, doing MP duty in Frankfurt, and then I got uh, moved to a place in the Moor, Belgium, was a holding camp, and then we they finally put us on a boat back to back to the states. Well, uh, all I know is we, they kept telling us we got number of points and I'd be, they'd go by every morning for roster and they'd call people up and all of a sudden you'd come up, your name would come up and you'd be, go out on a truck that night, go to another camp. And then they took us to uh, Antwerp and put us on a uh, boat. I think it was an old troop ship called uh, George Washington. And after a, considering that we came back with the first German prisoners to Boston in three days on the, on the uh, West Point, it took us about three weeks on this tug, which had the bilges overflowing and everything. The food was lousy. Oh God! See, the war is over now. They're giving you shit days. <laughs> and uh, so finally, it got into New York, and I was transferred up to Fort Devens and discharged honorably. And I was able to keep my German Luger pistol hidden all the time. And um, in the process, they said, we were told on the boat, this major comes up, he says, okay, now here are the rules. Does anyone have a submachine gun in there? Look at no sh submachine guns are permitted, you know. And some guys had to give up their Schmeisser German pistols, machine pistols. And I had two guns, I had a German Luger and a Belgian Browning automatic, both 9 millimeter pistols. So I gave up my Belgian Browning. Then when I finally got to Camp Shanks in New York, they said, anybody that's got their loot this far, you have it. So I could have come back with two pistols, I just came back with a German Luger. Then what happened? You got out? I got out. Too. Then I got out and uh, joined with the 5220 Club. That was a, uh, everybody that was a veteran got Twenty dollars a week for fifty-two weeks. It was a famous exclusive club, and uh, so everyone was a. All my friends and I were all go into a Park Square in Boston once a week and sign up that we're not working, and they give us twenty dollars. So that's when we have we go to baseball games and things like that. All our twenty dollars, go down and have a cheap beer, and it was living up. Then I. Then I decided I had some friends back at MIT in the wind. We're working in the aeronautical lab, so I went back there and I got an application and filled it up. Then I went to a prep school for about six months to get get my score up, 
I was accepted to MIT, the class of 1951. This was in the fall of 1947. That's when I started. Then after MIT, I studied chemical engineering, and, and uh, I did a, a thesis at MIT. I had to translate some German wartime documents, and one was some documents from by a German inventor by the name of Kausch, who was the great expert on hydrogen peroxide as a rocket fuel. And at that time, the U.S. Navy had captured some German miniature submarines which were propelled by hydrogen peroxide. And the Navy was interested in developing two-man submarines based on hydrogen peroxide powering. So I was the first guy to ever measure the viscosity of 100% hydrogen peroxide vapors without blowing himself up. So in the course of doing this work, I had all these German documents. And there'd be, there'd be coroner statements about what did Fritz talk about at supper last night? Because the next day Fritz's plant blew up and Fritz was no longer able to make hydrogen peroxide for Hitler. So I translated all these documents and I realized it was a very interesting su subject. So finally, we worked out a way to pacify hydrogen peroxide vapors by using a, a new material invented by DuPont called Teflon and we sealed the joints in our capillary tubes with Teflon gaskets, which the Germans didn't have at the time. So we were able to uh, operate with 100% hydrogen peroxide vapors and measure their viscosity through a capillary tube. But in the process of doing this, we had a couple of nice explosions, and I think it cost MIT something about $50,000 for me to complete my thesis by repairing the laboratory. I used to look through a slit in an armored plate this big armored cabinet in the end of the building, and I had looked through like a tank slit, like a tank driver uses. There's a slit in the periscope to read the instruments. And all of a sudden, everything goes blank. And you hear a big boom, and everything is blank. Did, uh, D, or uh, actually, D, not D Day, but. Uh, V-Day. You were in Germany then, right? No, I was in France. Oh, V-E Day. V-E Day. In V-E Day, I was... Uh, How did you feel? Where were you with? Were you partying? Were you, what are you doing? Well, we went out and had a few beers, and we kept saying, well, now we go to Japan. And I, my company was put on hold, and I said, well, I can speak German. I can stay here. And the guy says, well, you're in the Army now. If you speak fluent German, they'll send you to Japan. That's the army. It's perfectly logic if you're in the army. And, uh, and I said, yes, that's logical. That's absolutely in perf perfect logic. If you're a German interpreter, they'll send you to Japan. And it was true because I had a friend, uh, his name was Kaufman. He was a refugee from Germany. And he was with me in ASTP in, in, uh, down in Texas A&M. He could speak fluent German, had lived in Germany, and guess where they sent him? Japan. And we used to correspond about the, the logic in the U.S. Army. I'm the only guy that could speak German and went to Germany. That set a record for the U.S. Army military intelligence. Did, during, I guess it was D-Day, was D-Day, was, I mean, the D-Day era uh, time frame, uh, was that when you were in like real combat? I mean, was that real combat? Yeah, area? yeah, well. Or was that the, like the highest part of your combat area? Yeah, yeah, you, it got within, you could see German tanks at a distance, the Tiger tanks, but they were about a half a mile away. And uh, you could, Germans were still sniping, and they, a lot of them were surrendering. And uh, there was a terrible stench of powder and and dead bodies, you know. Some bodies had been around now for about two or three days and were really stinking out the place. Did, uh, what were your thoughts, I mean, when you were going over there then, to the, you were gonna be in war, I mean, you were gonna be actually in a battle, right? Yeah, yeah. What, I mean, did you, were you thinking about something else at the time? I mean, Nothing. you were young. Were I was you young. young, I was young. Did you really young. care? I mean, did you, were you really afraid or you just, 
I figured it was like a big game or something, and you know, I got to duck. After all, if John Wayne can do it, so can I. <laughs> so. Um, you have any funny stories about your buddies? I mean, like you guys going out and drinking, or anything that's really funny, and some songs with them, and the guys get at the pubs, and uh, you're from Boston, you like to sing a lot of the old Irish songs and stuff. I bet. Yeah, but see, I was with. In a, I was the only Bostonian in my company, so I took a lot of the jokes. They'd say, no baked beans today, you know, and uh, no Do you have any Italian buddies? Oh, yeah. The Irish? Was it an Irish-Italian thing? Or? Oh, yeah, there were a lot of things like that. And uh, I certainly, we used to kid uh, the, among the Italians. They'd say, gee, I wish I'd gone to Italy. And... Uh, because I can speak Italian, and the guy says, what accent do you speak? And one Italian says, are you a swamp dago or a mountain dago? <laughs> yeah. Did, uh, I mean, did you have any really close relationships with any of your buddies there that you still stay with, or you had before? You yeah, I had, I, I stayed in contact with two or three, but they're all dead now. I went to some reunions in New York and all you do, each year there were fewer people come. So finally, the guy that was running the reunions all died. And uh, occasionally, uh, I was working. Uh, I was working for Dupont one time. I was at Levere's building on a special assignment. I was sitting there, and this guy came in with a briefcase and went in. And he was a salesman, and he looked familiar. And he went into this office, and I said, "I've seen that guy before." Next thing I know, he's coming out of the office. I look again, and he looks at me. He was the chauffeur at Nuremberg that used to drive the, the uh, Judge Parker's Cadillac. Not a, he, had a, he had a packet clipper, an army packet clipper, which was the, the, the most modern car in Germany at that time. This was a 1942 cl packet clipper made just before Pearl Harbor. And, uh, and I looked at the guy, and I said, hey, and he was with me, and he, he lived up here in Media. His name was uh, Ronnie Blake or something like that. And uh, so anyway, we used to get together occasionally. But the funny thing was that in Nuremberg, uh, when the judges were in at night, he and I would be dating some wax, and we'd bring, drive them down to the, ho the Grand Hotel in Nuremberg drinking and I was sitting in, in the front seat next to him and we had two wax in the back seat and this was the most modern car there was a 1942 packet clip of streamlined and we were parked in front of the Grand Hotel and all of a sudden this Ford two-door Ford putters up with two stars on it he's a major general and he gets all of his Ford and looks back at this car and sees two wax in the back seat and uh, me and the chauffeur in the front seat. And he comes up and bangs on the windshield. Whose car is this? And I, and he says, and I said, it belongs to the judge, the Nuremberg War Trials. How does he rate a car like this? Well, he's a judge, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> well, was he pissed off? He was driving around in a two-door Ford. Did, um, what do you, well, let me ask you this. This is pretty good. What, what do you want generations to come to know and remember about World War II? Well, I'd say, uh, that, um, First thing I'd say, it was preventable. It, uh, but the trouble is the people that gave us the warnings were ignored. Like, uh, I think the first warning came from Anthony Eden. In, uh, by 1936, when Hitler took over the Rhineland, he was the one that said we should get together and go in and take out Germany right now. And no one listened to him. There, there were prophets, 
Uh, there was another prophet by the name of Homer Lee. He was a he was a a guy, a, an American living in China, and he wrote two books. One called The Valor of Ignorance, and the other called The Day of the Saxon. And he talked about Japan's future expansions, and he said that Japan will be the first non 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 white, non wasp, non Anglo Saxon power to cause trouble in the world. And they did. They took over most part of Asia before we had to fight them. And he gave the warnings, you know, in his book back in the nineteen twenties, that Japan would be a formidable power in the Pacific. And of course a lot of people saw Hitler was just a, a similar in Germany, but no one wanted to, to do anything about it. Now we've got the Bush brothers or the Bush father and son who tried to do this like Daddy Bush went in to Kuwait and what happened? They didn't do the job right. And now Juniors goes into Iraq not doing the job right. To run a war you need generals, you don't need MBAs from Harvard or Yale. Did you have any favorite song? What? From the war, favorite song? Yeah, Lily Marlene. I used to listen to German radios and they'd have a lot, a lot of very good songs. Very good music they had. They had good music, good tanks, and good artillery. Sound like that one place had some pretty good women, too. Yeah. Sing me that, that one that you were talking about in the, in the uh, tell me a little bit about that, the, the, the little song you were singing about the special. Oh, about the ASTP. Joke. Yeah, tell me the joke about that. Oh, it was a song the lyrics went, oh, take down your server's flag mother, your son's in the ASTP. That's the Army Specialized Training Program, which means you're going to college, you're not in the Army. You're in the Army, but you're going to college. I don't know all the lyrics, but uh, it was very funny. Um, anything else you want to tell me? If you can think of well, it, uh, well, uh, one time we used to take the judge, Judge Parker, was very religious, and uh, he liked to go to church every Sunday. So being his bodyguard, I had to go to church with him. So. He struck up a very good friendship with one of the English judges, Sir Norman Burkett. And in fact, on Sundays, we'd go over to Sir Norman's house, and Sir Norman had a little little, little house outside of Nuremberg, a, com a commandeered Nazi home, and he was there with his wife and his staff. So we'd go over there on Sundays and have tea. So this Sunday, we went to, uh, we took Sir Norman, to serve as the Mergendorf Lutheran Cathedral in Nuremberg. And there's a lot of U.S. soldiers in there and also a lot of Germans. And they had a special service for the Americans. So as a preponderance, almost everyone there was an American in uniform. And uh, except for Judge Parker and Judge Burkett and a few other people from the Nuremberg, there was also a major general in there in the U.S. Army and something went wrong. The chaplain couldn't make it. So we're sitting there looking at one another and looking at their wristwatches and all of a sudden this German section comes in and says, I have bad news. American chaplain is delayed. He can't make it today. So we were in a dilemma and of course some of the Germans were starting to chuckle, you know, all these inefficient Americans. So all of a sudden, all of a sudden, a uh, a voice comes from the back, and this this corporal walks up the aisle, and gets on the pulpit, and he says, "I'm Corporal So and So, I'm not a minister, but my father is." So he conducted the whole ser services from the pulpit. A corporal and he was, I mean, and this really really impressed me, Whew. because afterwards. Sir Norman Burkett said to us, he says, 
You know, he says, that could only happen. <laughs> my, my, my emotion, all these things. I found. It's like a little water. Yeah, I could. Yeah. There's some water. How are we going on time with the cave? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, sometimes I get very emotional thinking about some of these things. Okay, this is. I was getting very emotional yesterday at my wedding up in. My care. Little. <laughs> That's not the kind of water they were giving them out during the election. Which state was this? Right here. Oh, here, Mike here, that's Mike right. Here, city Council in Wilmington. City Council, yeah. Nothing for Sherry Freebity? <laughs> <laughs> for sure. Piss. <laughs> <laughs> for Sherry. Sure. She should go to Weight Watchers. Uh huh. She actually did a very good job with the parks and with the, the senior centers and things. I mean, she's, she's given to a lot of good people. A little loose, though. But I would say that incident there in the Mergendorf Lutheran Cathedral was that really affected me, because I realized right away that we made a very very good impression on this English judge, and we told and we showed the Germans that we could do something when something went wrong. Thirteen, hundred dollars a shot. Okay, so let's see. I think we pretty much. Pascal, can you think of anything? I like to watch some of these uh, history programs on World War Two, and my wife is always nagging me to oh, you shouldn't watch those things. I said, well, I'm saying I'm in some of these movies. And she said, which one? I said, I, I said I would say I was in a movie taken by the Germans at the prisoner exchange. Do you remember that one? We, that you were? Did you have you seen yourself actually? No, but I saw movies of the area of Vatel, France. Right, where they bring them. Where they bring the prisoners over. I was in the background that day, but on, on we had three exchanges with the Germans. Oh yeah, very, very one interesting uh, thing. Oh, I told you about the, the artillery blowing up the bordello and killing the girls. The Germans were very incensed about that. That's inhuman warfare, rolling up House of Ill Repute. Did, uh, we actually have some footage. So, you know, there was a U-boat that was captured off, off of Delaware. Oh yeah, yeah. And we actually had, we interviewed now, I didn't interview him, but Parks did. I was there with him one day taking some still photos of actually two guys that didn't really know each other mm -hmm. that were in the footage when they brought the prisoners on shore. I saw pictures of that, yeah. yeah. I think that was U-421 or something. Right. Um, How old were you when you went in? I was uh, 18. Um, did you think anything else? Did you want to do some slow pans and things? Okay. My biggest shock going in the Army was I was, having been born and raised in Boston, when someone said beans, there's only one type of beans in the world, Boston baked beans. I never heard of lima beans. I can remember getting the brown bread. Brown bread. And yeah. the beans. And the hot dog, yeah. And that was that was Howard Johnson's, who was from Mass, right? Where's yeah, that? that's right. 
featured that in every one of their restaurants. And that's you right. The, you could buy the brown bread and the cans. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. B and W or B and M or something like that. Right. Baked beans and brown bread. Yeah. So you're living here in Wilmington, or in uh, yeah, I live uh, in Pike Creek now. I used to live with a group of fellows from DuPont over in Wabasset Park. We had a townhouse over there, there were four of us. And one by one we all got married. So you got married late in life? Yeah. Smart man. Yeah. Did you I had, I, no, no, no. I had all the fun when I was young. Our good friend, J Rich Gordon, do you know Rich Gordon? Good no, I don't. No, I don't. From, he was over in Wawasset, still, still yeah. was there. Still lives there. He was DuPont, and his brother was DuPont. Okay. Um, do you want to just do some pans and? I don't know whether you knew. Um, did you ever meet uh, Jim Fossey? No. What was that name? No, that was my. He went to Dupont. My dad was. My dad was. Told you went to see was in Seaford. Just a lovely house. Mm. The nylon capital of the world. Well, hopefully, Russ, Russ Peterson. Russ Peterson, you know, was was in charge of uh, of that project, or was part of that. Was R Russ Peterson was part of that project? Yeah, I know um, him. Yeah, and uh, who's actually going to go to the pump? They actually were responsible for like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of lives, mm -hmm. apparently from the I guess the shock cord when they made them nylon for the paratroopers yeah. versus the hard. Uh, apparently saved a lot of lives, hundreds of lives. Mm. Um, I see him often. He's very much a part of the waterfront here, Russ is. Yeah, I saw him at the airport a few years ago, waiting for a shuttle, yeah. Did you work in Wilmington, downtown? I worked at Chestnut Run. I worked at the Experimental Station. I was moved around in DuPont, and then I came back to Chestnut Run. I worked downtown, it was a horrible place to work. I could see this incompetence coming on. One by one, the PhDs would retire, and they'd be replaced by MBAs. And I one time was assigned to work for this very obnoxious person who had told me, he says, oh, Tom, I want you to be on the ball. You have to give me a good record because, he says, I have a, I'm planning to be a vice president of this company within 10 years. And you work for a guy like that, you wish he was dead. He never made vice president. He quit and went to Japan someplace. Well, I, I have two ex-father-in-laws, and the, the one was was uh, was part of the legal department at the pot, Ed Connolly, mm -hmm. and uh, who was there when Irv, I guess Irv Shapiro was still there. The yeah. And then uh, Jim Fossen, who was. He was all around. He was up in Niagara Falls. Yeah, I used to know uh, Ned Kimmel. Yeah. His father was the right. fall guy for one of the fall guys for Pearl Harbor. They're still, still to this day, trying to uh, get him. A, yeah. Well, since 9/11, we know we have other incompetents that are far more higher profile. Absolutely. Absolutely. But the thing is, this when uh, I went to several meetings in Dupont, we had some of these MBAs coming up. And we had a guy who was in charge of the, one of the polyethylene programs. And we had plants at the Conoco acquisition. We had a plant in Matagorda, Texas. We had a plant in Victoria, Texas, and a plant in Orange, Texas, all making polyethylene. And we were in this meeting, and they had people from all the plants. And uh, so this guy had just been, he was on the fast track going up there. He had been in this job for probably about four or five months. And sitting around the table, he's asking people where they're from. And this girl says, I'm from uh, Victoria. And he says, what's it, Victoria? And she says, J unit making polyethylene. Oh, how about that? He didn't even know he had a plan in Victoria making polyethylene, and he was on the fast track. Do you want to do some sides of him? 
Or flip flops. And I'll pop them over here. Yeah, okay. Then I realized the ship was sinking fast. I refer to these people as having MBAs in basket weaving, which turn, is their. Turn to me. Hmm? You're going to just slide over in your chair this way. So yeah. Flip -flop. Is that good? Yeah, that's very good. Huh? Yeah. Is that okay? The light okay? Yeah, it's fine. Uh, what is your retirement upon? I retired in 89. One day I was sitting at the phone at Chestnut Run, and a guy called, I'm so-and-so, I'm with Highmont. And he says, we understand you're very knowledgeable in polyethylene. And I said, would you like to come and work for us? And I said, certainly. And I said, he said, uh, we understand you're going to retire very soon. And I said, probably within a year. And about, I said, okay, I'll, I'll, keep, I'll get your telephone number, I'll keep you in mind. And about the next day, my supervisor came in and he says, Tom, we're making offers to everyone. You're supposed to retire next year, but if you retire this year, we'll give you a special award package. And I smiled. Oh, isn't this beautiful? Isn't this beautiful? So I called back the guy, how many he says, and I says, I'm retiring next week. <laughs> and I went over to Highmont, an interview, and got a job. I was with them for four years as a consultant. Okay. Now, I need you just to look okay. at um, right. TJ. Yeah. Uh, TJ might entertain you, but yeah. please don't talk for a moment. So this game was real, real f talk about SA luck. You know, this was it. So I went over there and I went over to Italy. My wife and I went over a trip to Italy to do some working over there. It was very nice. And I discovered that a different policy. See, Highmont being an Italian company, they had a lot of Germans and French and Europeans, and nobody had an MBA, all PhDs. And they knew what they were doing. When I look back at what DuPont was doing, I said, oh my God, what a difference. Yeah. Tell me when. Yeah. Show us a beautiful profile of the female. Well, she might be beautiful. I like my one in the post office. Reward. Guilty of thinking. Illegal use of the human brain. Searching for truth. version of this is going to be out in May. Okay. We're going to have a little presentation in the middle of October, which you'll be invited to. Okay. Um, actually, at the old Nemours building. Mm. 